This morning, at the beginning of my message, I've asked several of our, our children that's called to ministry to help me start this message. In fact, they're going to come, and they're going to take about three minutes apiece, and they're going to share with us what a godly dad has meant in their life. Each one of these, they're, they know where they're going. Many of them have already completed. Uh, they're started in their vocation. They started in their profession. And many of, uh, but every one of them feel a calling of God on their life. And so we, we have many in this church that feel that same way. But I just chose out these very quickly and asked them if they would, if they would come and just share. Because I wanted to be impromptu almost. I wanted to be able to share what a godly dad had done in their life. And because I know their dads, and I know that their dads has given their best to be the example that God has for us. So we're going to start out this morning by asking some of ours. We're going to ask them that question. What did a godly dad do in your life? Layton, you come and start us out this morning. Morning. Good morning. So, of course, I have many spiritual fathers in the room. A lot of you have been just like a dad to me. But the guy I want to talk about today is sitting right over here. His name is Jerry Nallen, and he is the children's pastor um, here at Victory. Luckily, we got him in here today. We pulled him away from the kids. But um, having a spiritual father, as in the sense of like that he's literally a spiritual guy, it's just, it's been so impactful in my life. Um, he, growing up, made some rough decisions and went through a tough time in his life. And, but he came out of it and now he's serving the Lord with his whole heart. And I also, yeah, give it up for the Lord, right? <laughs> But uh, I also had a time in my life where I went through a rough patch, where I made some wrong decisions. And for me, him overcoming those rough decisions and his story has just been so impactful to me because I know that I can see where he is and I know that I have a future. I can, I can see my future through his life because he overcame, so I know that I can overcome. Uh, in the Bible, it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So my dad's testimony was a prophecy for my life. Um, and another thing is just that his passion for the word, he's always diving into the word. And it's just, it's so impactful that he is a seeker. And that has encouraged me to also just really dive into the word and look for look for the information and find out what, what I need to do to just just dig in the word and find what it says and so yeah, but dad, I love you. You've been so impactful to me in my life. And next I want to welcome Toby Yarbrough. Good morning. So this is a little out of my comfort zone. I'm supposed to, you know, I'm used to being over here serving in the worship team and, you know, just being my dad's right hand man. But um, I was asked to give a little word about, you know, my dad and how growing up with a spiritual leader like him, which is... <laughs> intimidating because he's such a, a spirit-led man, you know, in everything that he does. And I'm, you know, just growing up with him as a leader in my life has been the biggest impact. So if I've come up with two points uh, that have pretty, pretty sum up his, uh, his leadership in my life. So first is a, as a mentor to me uh, by the things that he says. So my father has been a godly mentor in my life, and he's helped me see things from a different perspective and how to, uh, how to handle situations with a godly demeanor. Uh, he has used leadership positions such as worship pastor or boss or uh, youth pastor in previous years um, to mentor me as well as uh, other young men in my same position. Um, and he's been the best example of a godly man in my life and has taught me how to be a godly man myself. And through the second point is as a role model by the things that he does. Uh, alongside teaching me with his words, uh, my father's actions have also helped me step closer into being a godly man uh, and working under him uh, at the job site. You know, um, his leadership has increasingly taught me how to handle stressful situations and how to approach them in a spirit-led way. And I've had a blessed life. I'm beyond grateful for the godly influence that has been displayed through his life, and uh, I pray that I've learned from him how to be a spirit-led father that I can apply to my parenting one day. 
So there's two verses that I want to charge all the fathers in the room and all the future fathers in the room. It's Ephesians 6, 4. It says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but raise them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. And second is Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So happy Father's Day. I love you so much, and you're the best. So we're going to have Heath Taylor speak. I love that. I basically get this opportunity to just brag about my dad. Um, if you don't know, which most of you have probably known me since I was really, really small, but my dad is the very dapper-looking gentleman playing bass. Um, <laughs> so one thing, well, many things, but my dad has really, throughout my entire life, imbued, I guess you could say, godly attributes into me is how I like to think about it. You know, if I didn't have a Christian father in my life raising me the way that I was raised, I, who knows where I would be? Who knows what my life would look like? Who knows what my family would look like? Who knows what my friends would look like? Who knows what my schooling would look like? Who knows what my church life would look like or if it would even exist? Um, so, my dad's own life and his personal life, I can even find a part of it inside of me where I have found myself learning how to love or learning how to be strong because I first saw him be strong and I first saw him love. He has been a very huge example of strength and love to me. And I was thinking about this yesterday as Pastor had asked me to share something. And one thing that my dad has shown me very well, and it's, it's a good thing, but it's not always an easy thing, is that my dad has learned how to love like Christ, which means he's also learned how to suffer like Christ. And even in the midst of a lot of suffering throughout long periods of times and things like that that my dad has gone through he's also learned how to love his children in the midst of it even whenever he was suffering he was still loving everybody around him even when he was in the midst of suffering and that to me is the perfect example of Christ so I love you dad and now I would like to introduce Colton I promise no joke this morning, guys. I didn't have time to prepare one. So, like, my golly dad is my, my stepdad who normally sits right here. If you haven't seen him, you, you probably heard him. Okay, actually, there, there's a joke. No more. Um, he unfortunately couldn't be with us today as he's running sound in the, at the Pine Bluff Church for them. And so just his journey is inspiration to me because if you think about it, if he hadn't accepted Christ those many years ago, I probably wouldn't be here before you and my journey here to the Victory Church wouldn't be as smooth as it could have been because I'm a firm believer what I did three years ago affects what I did today what you did yesterday affects me somehow today so if he hadn't have accepted that and accepted Christ in his life just um, just imagine where my life would be where his life would be my mom's life would be where everybody's life would be because what you do no matter what did you do affects the next person so just imagine that where your life would be had he not accepted Christ into his life. And next up, I want you to give it up for the one, the only, Abby Yabro! Oh my gosh. Coming in hot. <laughs> Good morning. Um, and I want to say happy Father's Day to all my spiritual fathers, including my papa and my dad. I love you so much. And it is an honor to stand before you and talk about this man because I have been extremely blessed in my life to call him dad, to call him friend. I told myself I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about something today that my dad has showed me in my life and, and just where he is in our family. Um, and I like to call him our covering and our rock. So all around, he's our spiritual covering that whenever we face hard things, whenever our family, oh gosh, <laughs> when our family goes through hard things, I know that we're going to make it through because he is our spiritual covering and he has our family and he's our rock. He's consistent and he is faithful no matter if he's on stage or if he's at the job site. 
I can't look at him. Or if we're at home just hanging out, you know, he's consistent, he's faithful. And so I just remember as a little girl, um, just wanting to be around him all the time because I feel safe. You know, he's a covering and he's a rock. So if he was going to Walmart, I want to go. If he's going to the job site, I want to go. If I need to walk, follow him around with a flashlight, I'm going to do it because I want to be around him because of that safe place that he has become in my life. Um, I wrote down on my notes, he is a reflection of the character of Jesus in our life. And because of that, he leads our family closer to Christ. And so there's nothing like having a dad who is our covering, who is our rock, and who is an example of Jesus Christ in our life. I remember as a kid just crying and remembering or just thinking like, Lord, I don't, I don't deserve such an amazing father. I don't deserve an, such an amazing family, but he's given it to me anyways. So that's what I have to say about you, Dad. I love you so much. Um, so, yeah. Thank you guys so much, and happy Father's Day. Whew, you about killed me. These children, when they, they're not kids anymore, all right? When the young adults, when they so precious, let's give them a hand, would you? Every one of them spoke volumes of truth into my life and created a, a desire in my heart to be more and to try to be that that they have seen so vivid in their dad's life. Now, there were other others that could certainly share about the wonderfulness of your dad. And then we as dads, we, we sit here today. Uh, many of us are perplexed, we're uh, c concerned. Um, then others of us are rejoicing. Uh, God has put some valuable men in my life. Whether it's a, in the mode of a dad or whether it's in the mode of a spiritual dad. Um, each man has this wonderful opportunity in life to, to influence others. And God has created us in the uniqueness of that. Now, on the Mother's Day, we were able to say thank God for all of the wonderful women that God had put into our life. But here today, we get to stop and we get to say, God, thank you for all the precious men that you've put into our and I'm here today to rejoice that not only for physical dads, but I'm here to rejoice for spiritual dads. And that's where many of you have served all the rest of us in this fellowship of believers and in this town that we live in. Uh, that God has used you to uniquely just be that word when a word of encouragement was needed, to be that direction when direction was needed, to be that help up, that step up, that climb up just when we didn't know what to do I tell you the, the safest place in all the world I believe is to be around spiritual men that have a love for God and a direction in their own life you know I look back over 
this wonderful gift of fatherhood and there's a, so there's such wonderful seasons there's a there's a picture that I always impresses almost every year that I see when I think about this day and it's it's a shadow picture of a of a child is standing on the shoulders of her dad as her dad is walking that um, that picture in itself relates what I believe that fatherhood is all about it's it's seemingly finding a place that's not in the spotlight to to be able to hold somebody up when they're going through struggles. I'm here to say to all the men that are in this church, whether you're a man that's 21 or whether you're a man that's 97, <laughs> I want to say thank you that God has used you in my life and I've watched you, I've watched God use you in the other people's lives. Because when we didn't know what to do, the Lord would provide a spiritual man that would come along beside us. That has helped me so many times. And I've got to enjoy this past week and, and just that. I got, was able to take two days away, as we call it, a deacon summit. And I was able to spend two days with uh, spiritual dads in my life in a unique fashion. It's, it's a time that we try to do every year where we just go and we talk about the spiritual things, of course, that God has uniquely got us all as a church involved in. But we're able to spend time just loving each other. And, and been one of the greatest joys of my life has been able to watch my spiritual dads grow older. And I tell you, they have laid a standard down in our life my spiritual dad, Johnny, 97 years old. And wow. And everywhere I go, I say, he's 97. It's, I can't believe it. <laughs> and, and, to, and then to be uniquely have him counsel me and to help me through things as God has so inspired a 97-year-old man that in the world would be considered <laughs> unable to to offer guidance even in his own life, but see what God has done with these men spiritually. And then George, which is, of course, he's at least over 37, something like 88, but see how the Lord has just blessed him. And then to be with my brother Donald and to see his age grow. I tell you, God has used spiritual men in my life, all my life, to help me. To help guide Jimmy, and you've been one of those that the Lord has just uniquely used you and in my life. And, and so I want to today, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about powerful dads. Uh, because there's, uh, that's not a topic that we would consider ourselves to be. Uh, because what we find out that in our weakness, if we have learned to lean on God then it becomes powerful even in the midst of our weakness. How God takes such weak men and God is able to pour such powerful strength into their life and which the Bible says that the weaknesses become strong. I dare say, I, I know very few self-made men. <laughs> I know a lot of people that try to hide behind that <laughs> and know that it's mostly fictitious because God did not create us to be able to be self-made men. God built inside of us, allowed weaknesses inside of each of our lives that would cause us to need Him desperately. And the more that we need him desperately, the stronger of a man that we become. You know, I dare say I have these wonderful young men in my life too. Uh, some of those were just here giving that testimony. I'm surrounded. Boy, it is so neat to be able to get up every day and to work with those people that are young and they have a heart toward God. It is so wonderful to be able to do that. 
And then, Billy, I look for that next generation. I remember so many Father's Day and Mama's Day working with you right alongside here. And then to think about the hearts toward God. That God has enriched us for so many years to be able to walk with young men and young women that deeply love God. That in, you take away God out of the equation and you find weaknesses in our lives that would not be able to be able to even carry on life. But then you take God in the equation that makes the difference. And last night I was able to pray with one of the fathers of this house, Bill, which is a unique father in this house. And, and then to be able to see how he's handled difficulty, how he handled battle, and how he was determined that he's going to make it through. I'm telling you, leaning on Jesus is one of the greatest things that any of us can do in life. And so the Bible talks about, it talks a lot about weak men being made strong through the very strength of God. So if you're here today and, and your weaknesses have seemed to overcome you and you say, I don't know how I would ever be able to push past this. I want you to know it's not about you pushing past and it's not about you doing. It's about you leaning. It's about you learning how to lean on a strength other than your strength and how to depend on a power other than your power that God is able to move in our life. Praise the Lord. In the Bible, there's this unique verse that's found in James chapter 5, verse 16. Powerful verse. And it's a verse that's built on prayer. And it tells us the thing that make weak men strong. It tells us how, what God is able to do. And in the last part of that verse, it says it this way. It says, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. And then the last part of the Amplified Version of the Bible, it puts these three words in there, or four words that says, dynamic in its working. I tell you what, it's been a joy to flow with men <laughs> that have the power of God that's in them through prayer and that there's a dynamic that you're able to see that works in their life. Here today, Dad, you may be discouraged. You may be at the point of almost giving up. Your job may have played out after so many years, and I've watched with, walked with so many men down through the years that their dependency was going to be on finally being able to come to fulfillment in their job and then right at the end the bottom fall out of their world but i tell you what i've watched men lean on the presence and the power of god that even in the midst of the rug being jerked out of their life they was able to prevail because there is a strength that doesn't depend on your strength and there is a power that doesn't depend on your power, Dad. There is help that doesn't depend on your ability to help yourself. But through the power of prayer, we're able to touch in to that dynamic, working power of God. Amen. So I want to talk to you about it. I still haven't found my notes. I was supposed to be preaching. I hope there's somewhere in my darkened house that eventually today I'll be able to locate so, but, but I just want to think about, I just want to talk to you about the things that the Lord had put on my heart that's, in, that's still in my heart and my mind from those notes that God told me to talk to you about today. And that's being a powerful dad, the earnest heartfelt. And, but I'm, I'm not going to talk to you about the normal things of prayer, but talk to you about the normal things of prayer. I talk to you about prayer, guys, and how Jesus taught us to pray. And I talk to you about the Lord's Prayer. And I talk to you about faith that is so important in the midst of prayer, which those are, are we, we would call common issues of prayer. I want to go a step beyond that, and I want to, I want to help that dad that is desperate for more power in his life. Uh, maybe maybe the children, maybe your children may be really serving the Lord right now, and you're in a season, the season where everything is going good. But one thing I found out about dads, seasons change. And even though today you may be in a real point of rejoicing over what's happening, you'll get up tomorrow and possibly you won't be able to rejoice over what's happening, but you will still have something to rejoice about because the God of all power is still able to be with you to bring you and help you through it. 
And maybe you're looking at dad, maybe you're thinking about the children. You say, I gave my life as, as a Christian dad, and now my children are beginning to drift away from God. And that's why it's so important that we recognize it's not in us, and it's not even of us, and it's not even what I do or what you do. But God offers us a power where weak men can become powerful, even in the midst of great difficulties, and God has a power to turn that situation around. And I want you to know the men of the Bible were of such kind of men. They weren't of men of great physical strength normally. They wasn't of men of great ingenuity, but they were men that learned simply how to lean on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ to take their weaknesses, their responsibilities. They were able to take those things and lean heavily on the cross of Christ. And it tapped them in to a source that was un. Fathomless. It was just a source that was unending. It tapped them into a power in the midst of their weakness. So I'm going to talk to you about some unusual things about prayer. The prayer today. Not, I'm not going to talk to you about faith because you know that unless you believe, it's not going to happen. That prayer won't work without faith. I'm not going to talk to you about the order of prayer because you know that you're to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. You know, but I want to talk to you about some unusual occurrences that can happen in prayer. First thing, I want to talk to you about the power of solitude. I want to talk to you about the power of solitude. And solitude is a, an, ex, an expression of discipline in a person's life that is a lot of times it tries to go out of our life. I mean, we, we try to forget about it. And even in this generation, if the person says, how can I change my situation? We usually say pray and fast, and that's usually our total list of things that can change. But I want you to know there are other dynamics of prayer that's important for a man to have in his arsenal of prayer that is able to turn desperate situations. Do you hear me? There's something in the spirit today that's ringing in that. And when I, tell you, when I say that word power, I can feel it deep within me. And when I say that word desperate, so I, I dare say this, there are those that are here today that's in a desperate situation or you're soon to face a desperate situation. So I want to give you beyond the normal how you can turn a desperate situation around. Or if you're desperate, then know this, there is, there is other degrees of prayer. Prayer is not just words that you say. It's not just words or communication because solitude is a very much, very important part of a person's prayer life. In fact, the Bible said there were times that Jesus prayed as a group in the garden with his disciples. There were times that Jesus prayed normally, but there were times that Jesus would go out into the wilderness alone. Everybody say alone. And that's what solitude is, not solitude. Somebody says, well, I'm just alone all the time. That's not solitude. I'm talking about a definite time that you have chosen in your life to separate people out of your life and you've chosen to put your heart on God for a, for a given period of time. And you have chosen to dedicate your life into solitude. So solitude is a mighty. Because, see, things are revealed in solitude that will come no other way in your life. I'm amazed at the people that I walk with that's never felt the genuine presence of God. I'm amazed at people that try to operate life never feeling and sensing the very power of God. I'm amazed at people at life that they operate just simply out of prayers that they pray from one direction. And they never, are, they never have the strength that comes as prayer becomes not you know, only one direction, but as prayer becomes in two directions. Solitude grants you that. Out in the old church, we knew the power of solitude. And that's why that we had a room that was especially dedicated to just times of solitude. What that was this. We had a room in the old church that was dedicated. We call it the prayer garden. But what it was dedicated, it was dedicated to the discipline of solitude. That's where a man say, I've just got to touch God. Man, what I'm going through is too hard. What I'm facing is too rough. I've got to t 
touch God. Or maybe a person said, I've got to experience the Lord. I'm going to tell you, there are days when just prayer will do it. But there are days that you will face where just prayer will not do it. But the presence of God added into prayer will do it for you for the glory of God. And that's what solitude does. Solitude draws the presence of God into your life like nothing else. And it's a time of dedication that you dedicate a certain period of time to God. Lord, I'm giving you, I'm going to shut everybody else out of my life, God. I'm going to go in this room. I'm going to lock that door. And I'm going to spend 24 hours, almost spend 12 hours with you, God. And God sees that heart that is so dedicated. And God responds to that. And God comes in his presence. I'm here to tell you that if you have prayed with the presence of God and if you prayed without the presence of God you have learned one thing it's nothing like the other to pray with the presence of God means everything to bring in about difficult situations turning around for the glory of God so what that means, look, most of the time we just accept our prayer life is, is just because we, we just expect. And we think this is prayer. And a lot of times we just go through words and we think this is prayer. Let me, prayer is to be built around the presence of God. When the Bible talks about the word seek, S-E-E-K, when the Bible talks about seeking God, it's talking about not just praying words. It's talking about seeking the face. In fact, the Hebrew word there is for the word face. Face. It means seeking the presence of God. And when you get God to come in his presence, it changes everything for the glory of God. It takes weak words and makes weak words into strong words. It takes weak people and takes weak people into changes them into strong people. It takes times of indecision and all of a sudden decisions become possible. It changes everything, the presence of God. And so that's what solitude does. It draws the presence of the Lord. Now the word glory in the Bible is a very important word because the glory of God is God's presence coming into your life. The word glory is the word weighty. It means the word weight. It means when God's presence comes, it becomes a weight. There, there is a sense of of, there is a sense that comes in the presence of God is the weight of God. When God begins to come on you, you will begin to sense the weightiness of his presence. It becomes, I find that in the presence of the Lord, for those that spent long amounts of time in solitude, now I'm speaking out of a group of people that believe in solitude. And I, and I know that many of you have dedicated time to the Lord. And I encourage every person in this church, man, to dedicate a time every month to where you get, God say, God, I'm going to shut everybody out of my life. I'm going to give this night to you. I'm going to go in that room. I'm going to lock that door. And I'm going I'm to ask no family member. I'm going to ask no one. I'm going to give that time to finding you. See, the Bible gives us the responsibility of training our senses to be able to feel God. Did you know that's your responsibility as a disciple? That it is our responsibility as a disciple to train my senses. Now, when I was born into this world, it didn't take my senses long to learn that's hot and that's cold. You understand? It, we, it was easy to form our senses, to train our senses to detect certain things. Hot, cold, warm, this, that, good time, bad, that, bad weather. But God has given us the responsibility. The Bible says that a person that is led by the Spirit trains his senses to discern both good and evil. God has called us to seek after his presence. And I, like I said, I am so amazed at some people that's never, ever felt the presence of God, never felt the hand of God as, as God would place his hand on your life or place his hand on your back. I remember when I was first saved, one of the most glorious experiences I ever had all of my life, I remember I was at that altar and I was praying, and I remember there was this huge hand that was placed on my back. And all of a sudden when that hand was placed on my back, I could feel the power and the strength. I turned to see, and there was no one there because it was the hand of God. What I'm just saying that that God wants to teach every one of us how to feel his presence in some way. And God wants to teach us how 
to train my senses to discern not only God, but also evil. And that's why we don't make it in life because somebody said, man, if I could have just known that was going to do that to me, I wouldn't have done it. If I would have learned that that decision was, was going to, I would not have made that decision. That's because God expects us to discern or to train our senses our senses. God expects me to train my senses. And I've been amazed uh, running around with people that just love God, how people have trained their senses. There was this precious Baptist lady that just loved God with all of her heart out there in the old church. And she would come, this precious Baptist lady was, uh, as, I, as I, my understanding was, was not filled with the Holy Spirit, but she had the Holy Spirit from the point of salvation. And how God had, she had trained her senses to be able to even smell the presence of the Lord. And the Bible talks about the sweet odor of God. And, and, she, and I remember she would come up to me service after service and say, you know what, I, Jerry, she said, I could smell the presence of the Lord. I could smell the incense of God. I could smell the incense of the Lord here this morning. I said, wow, God. Isn't that precious that she's even trained her sense of smell to be able to detect the presence of God? I said, isn't that scriptural? Boy, isn't that wonderful that she has trained her senses to be able to discern good, discern God, and then to be able to discern evil or discern the devil? So God has called us to do that, and that's what solitude will do. Solitude, spending a definite period of time in the presence of God will draw the presence of the Lord into you. And as the presence of God comes, you will learn that, that God will help you for your senses to become made alive unto him. In fact, the book of Acts says that they, the, the early church, they learned to feel after God. They would literally begin to feel, use their senses to feel God. Now, I just want to ask you, Jen, I don't want any... Uh, don't, uh, uh, don't answer any kind of way. But I just want to ask you, how many of you have ever felt the presence of the Lord? You felt the presence of God to where you knew it was the Lord, the, to where you was able. Well, see, that presence is not just for feeling. That, dread, that presence is for empowering. In the presence of the Lord, that, that's where we're to gain the sense of joy to live a victorious Christian life. If you're having a struggle with joy, it may be because you have a struggle with the presence of God. Because, see, it's in the presence of the Lord that that fullness of joy begins to develop. And I find out that in the presence of God is where all the gifts of the wonderful spirit. See, God has called us into a realm of supernatural living and supernatural life. God wants to be your dependency. God wants to be your strength. God wants to be the one. And God has answers to every question we could ever have. Where we, we think we're getting smart. I mean, you know, and we, we learn to develop our own selves and develop our own knowledge to where that we can come up with our own answers. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. God's answers always work. Yeah, go ahead and give the Lord. Cause they, uh, they give the Lord praise because they, their answers always work. God knows how to deal with what you're dealing with. God knows how to deal with rebellious children. God knows how to deal with jobs that's going flat. God knows how to bring relationships into the place that they need to be. God knows. God's answers always work. Our answers sometimes work. And I've learned one thing in life. I'd rather be hooked up with plans or answers that always work than to depend on myself that just sometimes work. So God has called us in the person. So things that you can do in your life to encounter the presence of the Lord. So I want to just mention that one with you as that point of solitude. That is a point that is a discipline in a Christian's life. As Jesus did, he went out alone. He has definite periods of time. That not, he does not live alone. Somebody say, I'm alone all the time. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you living alone. I'm, not, I'm talking about you choosing of times of aloneness for God to come to you and to the ded dedicated to the Lord. Now, second one I want to talk to you about is the sense of symbolism. The symbolism is so important in the presence of the Lord. And I'm going to close with this. And symbolism is so important. Uh, you uh, taking the ability of the Lord uh, did you know the whole Old Testament is written in symbolism? The whole Old Testament. 
Uh, when you're talking about the when when you're talking about the uh, uh, the tabernacle, are are you talking about uh, the the, uh, the the going into the presence of the Lord? All of that is symbolism. Uh, the Old Testament symbolism causes you to see something physically that has a much deeper representation. Uh, did you know everything in life is like that? Did you know God means for everything in life? to have a much deeper meaning that would teach you the things of God. Everything, every bird that flies, every eagle that takes to flight, God meant that. God, God meant for us to look for His glory in everything. Everything that moves, everything that doesn't move, God's intention was for everything to give glory to God. And so one of the greatest disciplines of closeness with the Lord and which I would totally change the power you have. Remember our scripture? It said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, makes much power available. God bring me in that place of much power. Lord, I want to be a daddy with much power. I, I want to be a father with much power. I, I want to be a pastor with much power. I, I want to be a spiritual dad with, with much power. God, bring me into a place of powerfulness with you, Lord. And so we learn that symbolism is of vital importance. In fact, as they would op operate in symbolism in the Old Testament, as Moses would walk into the holy place, the presence of the Lord would meet him there. As he would walk into the most holy place, the presence of God would meet him here. Let's drop back just for a quick moment. I want to speak this on solitude. Elijah knew for him to be able to handle the trials of life, he had to be able to get to the mount to get in the cave, to be alone with God, to hear God in a deeper way than he'd ever heard the God before. Moses knew if he was going to be able to do the tremendous responsibility that he had of leading three million children across an embankment of trouble and difficulty, he climbed the mountain to be alone with God. And there in the loneliness with God, God came to him. And God gave him a supernatural strength and a supernatural power to handle life as we know it. So not only is the solitude, but then letting everything, using symbolism. You know, this is such a wonderful symbol. Many of you have a wonderful symbol that you wear around your neck. That you know that that is almost a modern thing. The early church didn't use the cross as symbols of joy. It was symbols of pain. It was symbols of difficulty. It wasn't what you rejoiced about. But I think about the symbolism of this cross. And then I think about, and, and just as you begin to take all the creation and just meditate on how God is there and the goodness of God, man, it becomes like waves and waves of God's power and God's strength just begin to come over your life, man. As you, as you just think about the geese that's flying and, Lord, what an order they have. And how, Lord, that you use such unity, God, to to cause ease and flight and such length to be traveled. I mean, everything, everything that God has ever created brings glory to God. And so the, the cross is such symbolism as we think about it. I bring my burdens here. I bring my cares here. This morning, before daylight, I came. The symbolism means so much to me. 
It's not that I honor a piece of wood or I honor an altar that is just a symbolism of something that is greater. <laughs> uh, even the altars that are built in this church, they, they're just symbolism of an altar that's in heaven, that's unchangeable, that has power and glory going out from that altar at all times. Wow. But through uh, this symbolism, through our faith, we, we begin to intermingle. With the depths of God. This morning, and as I was gathered here before daylight, and I was thinking about the heaviness of the day. I was thinking about the, I was thinking about the people that certainly had their homes destroyed last night, and the people that were hurting, the people that was getting up, and there was. And I, I, I just come and I, I grabbed a hold to this symbol of something in heaven that's unfathomable. The cross has the power to change everything. The cross has the power to change everyone. And I began to think this morning of the load that I was carrying, and I began to just take my head and lean it on this symbol. And in the process of there, some there came an intermingling as I began to lean on this right here. There became a... A, a change began to happen. Not here, but there. All of a sudden, my deep problems All of a sudden, I found out that I'd rather have his yoke than my yoke. Because my yoke is heavy and his yoke is light. Then I began to come to this altar. And it certainly wasn't this piece of wood. None of that. But I used that as we use all of creation to find him. And all of a sudden, I was no longer kneeling at an old wood piece of wood. It was, the Bible says, I've come to a heavenly altar. And I chose at that heavenly altar to lay everything I cared about, everything I was worried about, everything I was bothered about, I chose to lay it there on a heavenly altar. And out of that heavenly altar becomes the promise that all things will work together for good if I can leave it on that heavenly altar. So one of the first ways, there's a lot of different things I want to be sharing with you in the next several time, but one of those things is solitude. And the other thing is symbolism you will find releases of God's power and strength and grace and will no more be just dependent on your words to change your life. It will be words that have been empowered by the presence of God. And then all of a sudden, prayer life is not just prayer life. Her life is exciting life. As I began to use things to help me touch a greater force. And God uses all these things to help us see things that we've never seen before. To help us feel things that we've never felt before help us hear things that we've never heard before and helps us to know things that we've never known before to help us live a measure of life that we've never been able to live before 
through prayer. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, we come to the close of our Father's Day time, Lord. It's been good, Lord. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh! Oh, it's been good just to have a season to think about the goodness of God and the wonderfulness of your presence, Lord, and the greatness of your kingdom, of which there is no end, Lord. There is no end to you and to your living through us, your kingdom, Lord. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, as every head is bowed just for a quick moment, I, I want to take just a moment and say, maybe you're here today and this is a, maybe a unique day. That you say, Pastor, there's things in my life that shouldn't be there. I, I just want to. I want to gain God's strength in my life. I just want to. If you're here today and if you need prayer, I want you to just take that little right hand of yours. I want you, while every head is bowed, I want you to slip it up toward heaven. Would you do that right now? Lord, I come into agreement over those precious hands. Lord, that you would cause a difference to be made, Lord. Lord, don't let this be just another season, Lord. Lord, cause this to be something wonderful. Lord, use that very need to cause us to find a depth of your power that we've never known before. Lord, bring forth an experience with you that we've never, ever had before, Lord. And then, Lord, I pray for the spirit of solitude. That, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would call us away to those unique places. Lord, help us, Lord. Lord, it can be as simple and easy as just dedicating a room to you one night a month and going in and shutting the door and saying, God, I need you like I've never found you before. I need to see you. I need to feel you. I need to touch you. Or it can be as complicated as going off and taking that tent and putting it up for three days and saying, Lord, I won't come out of this tent until I find you, Lord. Lord, create times and places in our life that we will be able to forever remember that God is real and your power is strong. Powerful men may strong through the power of God in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on, let's stand in worship. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I was created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Son for 
Jesus for what you've done, God. We give you all the glory.